Hi, I'm Renee McGuire, and I live in Pearland, Texas, USA, since this may go around the world. Um, I pray that uh, God will use it for his glory and uh, that it will speak to many other people that either have been here or are seeking. Um, this is uh, my testimony, uh, life-changing event that happened at one moment in time in my life. I was 48 years old and it was September the 17th, 1998. People cared enough about me to um, encourage me to go to a retreat, an Emmaus Walk 182, for all you have, who have done Emmaus Walk. Uh, it was a time of quiet uh, reflection uh, regarding something that had been building for a long, long time. You know, you do life the way you think you should do life and based on your background and your parents and how everybody else does life and you're greatly influenced by the world and family, uh, especially the world around you, cultural, society, um, traumas, joy, uh, people that have come into your life. Uh, I was at a state of, um, I had lived life, I created my own rules, which we all do. We think we know what's best for us. We think we know what's right. Um, and at well, some point in life, I looked back at my life and said, you know, something's wrong. <laughs> Things just, I'm not where I thought I'd be at 45, 46, 47, and all through. Actually, it had been building for a long time. Um, I was had gone through my second divorce. I financially was doing well. Um, I was dating a guy I'd been dating for three or four years. And... Um, on the outside, everything looked really well. I had it all together. Uh, what more could you want? Uh, but as I look back at my life, I uh, had a very large burden on my shoulders of not only looking at my life, but looking how I affected other people, mainly my son, who I love dearly. Um, you know, we raise our kids, too, with our own rules. And we make them up as we go, because like everybody says, well, there's not a book. Well, actually, there is. It's called the Bible. Unfortunately, some of us learn that too late. Uh, where to find the answers? Uh, you read all these self-help self books, parenting books. We had Dr. Spock, whose son ended up committing suicide. Uh, he wanted to scratch all his books and all this, his philosophies and all of his ideas. And uh, it was a very confusing time of my life as I realized that I didn't really know what truth was and neither did anybody else. When you ask them what truth is, it, for 45 minutes to an hour, they would stumble through their ideas and then when we play out the consequences, uh, they determined they couldn't live by those ideas. Uh, I never played out the consequences in my life of my ideas, of the ideas from the 60s, which we grew up in. I was born in 52, and uh, the uh, late 50s and early 60s, especially the 60s, were very tumultuous. We were in rebellion uh, against our culture and our moral uh, values that had been instilled in us and were very strong prior to the 60s. We uh, disassimilated all the philosophies and uh, you know the church where was the church well they thought that's ridiculous they you know they'll grow up they'll see the truth and so they didn't really defend the faith they didn't uh, stand up they didn't help us with our ideas um, our parents just thought well we're we're in rebellion we'll go back to our values later on in life, which uh, 
to a certain extent did not happen. It just, we kept following the culture and the culture was going off a cliff. And I realized that everybody was messed up as I was, that nobody really seemed to know any answers, but you just did life as usual. You stayed busy, you poured yourself into work. Uh, I poured myself into work uh, and you know, I neglected my main responsibilities, which was, of course, my son. And I gave him all the material things because, you know, the, our culture kind of led us to believe that that's what will make people happy, that more money, more stuff. So my son had everything that I thought he wanted, except that he never really wanted it. And I didn't really know what he wanted. And all the time, as I learned later, all he wanted was, was me which uh, life is going to either, the things that happen to you in life, they're either going to harden your heart or soften your heart. And in my case, it uh, hardened my heart. You don't want to be vulnerable. You don't want to be hurt. And so you begin to build a wall around you. And the problem is, is you don't let people in that you love either. Um, it was in my family... Uh, through my 30s, 20s, and 30s, I was, um, when I was 26, I was had my son, and when I was five months pregnant, uh, my husband was having an affair, and it was very difficult um, going through that pregnancy. It was very painful, and uh, him not being there, and he did come in for the morning that, that I had him at 7 o'clock. For a little while and then went back to his life and uh, it was it was a very tough time I went through a lot of emotional pain and from that I determined that I was going to money was the answer that you could uh, it was power and that you could protect yourself and that nobody would ever hurt, hurt me again because I didn't need anybody and uh, I wasn't going to put myself in that position anymore uh, I had a very low opinion of men my dad was an alcoholic and I don't really remember much of him uh, until my later life when he got cancer and uh, we spent uh, uh, some time that was as he was dying and talk about things that he never talked about um, too little too late uh, but it was a special time. So uh, there I am in this chaos and tumultuous inner um, struggle that you can't really put your finger on it, but if you stay busy and have fun and, you know, uh, do the things you think that are going to make you happy, that maybe somehow it'll all work itself out, and it doesn't. It just actually gets worse. Uh, never really went through depression because uh, I was too busy going forward and and um, focused on other things beside uh, you know uh, looking inward. So uh, I think it's only when you really look inward that you really realize the depravity of your you know your soul, your spirit, your your life. And uh, I think there was a time that God began to. Let me really see things the way they are um, and begin to take a veil or as the Bible says, the veil off or scales started coming off my eyes, uh, not really knowing what was happening. So it was September 17th, 1998, and I, my sister had invited me, a church sponsored her, and she requested that they sponsor me to go to this three-day retreat. And during this retreat, I there were a lot of people that loved on us. Of course, we got the, the gospel. But there was something else that we got, of course, away from the world and away from things pulling us away from seeking and searching for God. Um, we heard stories of people pain, loss of a child, child dying of cancer, 
loss of husbands, loss of loved ones. But in the midst of the grief, there was always this joy that was brought about by something that was deep in their soul that, um, that they explained as born again, Christ, the Holy Spirit, uh, that it just transformed their life so that even during this time of grief, uh, they had a great they had a great joy. Um, so what happened was, I was in the after being loved on tremendously by people I didn't even know. Uh, I couldn't really understand what and why this was all happening, but it's a time that God had really brought my life uh, to um, a point to where I really, in my deepest anguish, I guess, that I never really faced and never really looked at, that I would be touched by the love of people I didn't even know. And also by, uh, which I didn't know at the time, a God that I didn't know, his love. He would use other people to, to touch my life and help me see a little small piece of, of his love for me that I couldn't understand and couldn't see at the time because, after all, it was just an idea that I had read in a book and had been taught all my life and it sounded great and I believed in it and it was just wonderful and I celebrated Christmas and, um, you know, I was all in. And uh, But the one thing I didn't know that became more obvious that weekend was that it was a personal relationship they had. And I didn't really quite understand where this was coming from. Um, but I was to understand at the last day of the retreat, I was sitting in the chapel by myself. And the burden, the weight of the world was really on my shoulders. Uh, I was being crushed by the things I drug my son through. And... Uh, it was just really heavy on me, and I'd been carrying it around for a long time and really just to the point that I was exhausted. Uh, there seemed to be no answers, seemed to be no hope, and I just really felt that I just couldn't keep carrying this. Not, not suicide, not anything like that, but I just emotionally, physically, spiritually could not do this anymore and I didn't know what to do and I remember walking down to the altar and I was weeping and uh, I fell to my knees and I cried out to God and I said you know I I just can't do this anymore and and uh, I I didn't expect anything to change I didn't expect anything to happen I wasn't really expecting anything I was just really weeping and crying out to God for what I don't know. I didn't know there was anything more. I had no idea. And then as I came back, continuing to weep, all of a sudden, in one moment in time, this light, this glory went through me to the deepest part of my soul and it just this love flowed in this forgiveness flowed in this person flowed into my life the doors flew open and I was just God was pouring himself his spirit into me and I have never felt so loved and the burden that I was carrying I remember one of my favorite scriptures in Matthew was oh ye who are heavy laden bring me your burdens 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest for your weary souls. I kept thinking about that and, and couldn't imagine how he could give us rest for our weary souls. But at that moment in time, my life changed forever because he personally and intimately came into my life, which I never really, nobody ever told me that you could have a personal, intimate relationship where you could know him and he knew you. And it changed my life forever. I was so in awe. It took the breath out of me. It was like <gasps> taking a deep breath. And oh my gosh, all I could think was, he's alive, he's real. It's not just words written on a page 2,000 years ago. It's really real. He's alive. That's all I could do was, for months after that was tell people of this awesome thing and the, wanted them to know, no, no, it's not, you know, it's not what you think it is. It's real. And, of course, people would look at me like, you know, uh, yeah, okay. And she's crazy and uh, she'll get through it, my husband thought. Uh, I told my friends, well, you know, it's, it's a fad. Six months, she'll be over it. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, I got worse. <laughs> okay. And I was 24 hours a day, seven days a week, inhaling the Bible to find out who this awesome, awesome man was, who this God was, who this, what, you know, I didn't really realize what happened to me. And, and I remember I found a really good church that was solid on the Word of God. I came out of a Catholic church, and I remember when I went, uh, the next weekend I didn't know what else to do and I just wanted to repent 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 of all my sins and uh, so I went to the priest and I said you know I want to do confession and, and then in these days they just sit down in a chair and you just talk to them like everybody else and so I, I began to say the confessional and and I began to tell them my sins and they were just pouring out all this stuff and after just a minute or two he's like okay well you know, here's your penance, say this and say that. And it's like, but I'm not finished yet. I still, I, I, there's still more. And I just wanted to really come clean. And, you know, and he was like, uh, that's enough. You don't have to tell me. Just say this. And you're like, you're forgiven. I thought, wow, is that it? <laughs> you know, I was like, I just have so more I want to get out because I just want to be washed, washed. I want all that stuff washed and cleaned and, you know, um, I didn't realize that God was doing it, uh, you know, as I was spewing out all this stuff in my heart. He was cleansing me. He was transforming me. He was drawing me close to him. And uh, uh, my life began to change after that. So uh, in all this craziness and soaking up, I remember I couldn't wait to, uh, I would read the Bible. I'd have to go to work in the morning. I hated to leave uh, the presence of my father. I'd go to work. I'd do, you know, the secular thing that you do, you know. And then I couldn't wait to get home in the afternoon uh, and crawl up on my daddy's lap and, you know, just read more about who he was and just fill his arms around me just saying, I got you, you're going to be all right. And uh, just fellowshipping with him. You know, I never had that father to do that with, to, you know, um, I just asked a million questions and read the Bible and as he answered me and told me stories and rocked me in his arms and wow, what a loving father we have. What an awesome God we have. It's, it's what we've always longed for. It's, it's, it's a void in our life and we don't know what to put in there. So we put people and other stuff that never fills it, and we're always hungry, and we're always thirsty, and it reminds me of the woman at the well when the Samaritan, when Jesus was waiting for the disciples to come back, and she said, you know, he, he asked her to give him some water, and she said, well, you, you don't have a bucket, basically. You don't have anything to put it in, and, and you know, he saw her with that empty bucket, and, and that she would fill it he says, you're going to drink this water. You're going to fill that empty bucket, and you're going to drink of it, but you're going to be thirsty again. He says, but I have some water 
that if you drink of this water, you'll never be thirsty again. And, and he was trying to tell her, talking about her life. And he says, look, you've got five husbands, and, 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 and you're on your fifth husband, and that's not enough. You're still thirsty. You're still empty. You're still going to that well to try to fill the emptiness in your soul. But he had a water that would only be filled, be filled by the living water that we would never thirst again. So praise God, you know, he was trying to tell her of something that uh, was hope, hopeful. She had no hope. She had no hope. So it's the same for us. We are empty, and we don't really know what it is, so we try to fill it with people and things. Um, and then when people and circumstances let us down in 